Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And thank you to coming, for coming to another MS Views and News program. I believe that tonight's program is already the 15th program of this year, okay? And that's pretty good considering just a few years ago, we only did 15 programs in one entire year. So tonight is our 15th program. We have so many other schedules through, to get us through the rest of this year that we are gonna be finishing somewhere around 46 at the end of the year. And that's not just in the state of Florida. We are now doing programs in eight states. So we've expanded. So before I go any further tonight, I wanna to first thank Teva Neuroscience and I want you all to thank them as well. They gave us the funding to do tonight's program. So for those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman and I too have multiple sclerosis. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News and thankfully we are growing. We are growing, like I said, we're doing programs in eight states now and we're doing this because people are seeing what we are doing in the state of Florida and they want us to get these programs to them in the other locations. So that's what we are doing. Um, again, I spoke to you about the video recording. In addition to, by the way, in addition to Teva Neuroscience, we also want to thank tonight Genzyme, Malincrot, Novartis, Accorda, and Biogen for, doing, for supporting tonight's program. Again, we don't get the funding to do these programs without their support. We are not looking at private dollars to support us. We are asking the pharmaceutical industry, and they want us to be able to educate all of you by giving us the funding to do these programs. So I thank them again. All right, tonight's program, pretty simple, right? Pretty straightforward. Dr. Steingo is here to speak with you about different topics. All right, he's gonna speak with you about the knowing the right time to change your MS therapy, your MS treatment medication. After he speaks about that, we're gonna take a short pause, and then we're gonna talk about something brand new that you all do not know about yet, but it has to do with the land of MS. And Dr. Steingel will explain all of this when he gets up here to speak with you after. After Dr. Steingel speaks about his two subjects, we'll then do Q&A, all right? After both, we'll do the Q&A. So if you can, write down whatever you need to ask him, and then I am going to go run around the room later on with a microphone, all right? Please wait until I get to you with the microphone. You do not have to worry about the video or the camera seeing your face if you don't want it to, all right? It will hear your voice. If you don't want to be, sound, if you don't want to be heard when it's your voice, then just try to pretend you're Mickey Mouse, all right? Make, be, speak like that, or speak like the next guy that's gonna speak later on, all right? So after Dr. Stein goes Q&A, Dr. Schaefer came down from Vero Beach, and he's gonna speak with you about something new that you all will hear about later on. Now, I'm not gonna take any more of your time. We're just gonna get started. By the way, oh, last thing. It's not up on the screen right now. We are doing a live stream event from Indianapolis where we're doing our next event on May 26th, and it's a live stream webcast. So you'll be able to go to our website and just click on the link to register for that program. And then you'll be notified a few days in advance of that program. It will let you know where you have to go to. It'll give you the URL for you to click on. And you'll be able to watch that program. That night, you'll be able to see a different speaker from Indianapolis and a nurse practitioner that's going up from Central Florida who will be speaking at that program. You'll watch this live. You could say, hey, I know these people. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming. So the topics I'm doing tonight uh, are topics selected by Stuart. That's why it's very important that you give us your input so we can decide what to do next time. Some of you may have been there last night. We actually had another session last night where we talked quite extensively about diet and self-help aspects, exercise, managing fatigue, all the things you do for yourself. And last night, actually, we had a smaller group and a very open, interactive group. It was an excellent meeting. And so I don't intend, some people that were there last night are here tonight, I see. We're not going to repeat that. There are so many different topics that we could have a different session each night of the month and talk about different topics about MS. And the entire subject I call the land of MS. And so you've seen me talk about the land of MS before. And so you know that the land of MS has many different topics in it. And each night, we could pick a different topic to talk about. And so Stuart tonight specifically asked me to address something in this area, which is the treatment topic, the drugs that you use to treat MS. We could talk about how you diagnose MS and what types of MS there are. And there's some overlap between all of these. Obviously, all of these, to make you have a, a lot of, to, to give you sunshine and make you have a happy 
landing in the land of MS, all these topics relate together. So we could spend a lot of time talking about the symptoms of MS. And we might briefly talk about some of them. And then the medical support you get from the psychiatrist or the physical therapist or the ophthalmologist. The most important issue of social support, social interaction, joining support groups, coming to a group like this, maybe meeting new people, learning new, new things. And then the most important uh, aspect of self-help, uh, really this is, is a good place for this to be because if this was a building, this is one of the foundations of it, is what you do to be part of this team. So tonight what Stuart asked me to talk about is deciding when your medication is working for you or not working for you and when, a time, when the time comes to try and switch the medication. And so I wanted to show you something about the symptoms of MS for you to know first that the symptoms of MS can occur in many different ways. So if you think about it, the symptoms could be, the sta it could be stable. Every time you come for your visit, you might say there is no change. Between now and six months ago, there has been no, no change. We call that stable. It doesn't mean you don't have symptoms. It means that the symptoms are the same as they were last time. And they could be constant. So you could say, I have the same tingling and numbness that I had last time, and it's there all the time. Or it might come and go. It might have good days and bad days. It could fluctuate. Or you could have new symptoms. Or you could have progressing symptoms. So all these things over here are important things for us to know when you come for your visit, which is really what we're going to emphasize uh, in the second half of this talk tonight. And this over here refers to the types of MS. And your symptoms help us decide what kind of MS you have. So the commonest kind of MS, as you know, that everyone talks about is this. So 80 or 85% of people start out with relapsing and remitting MS. That is by far the commonest. And a relapsing MS is somebody having an episode. There are many different words for this. Episode, attack, flare-up, exacerbation. Anybody know any other words for this? How about exasperation? That's one of the words that comes up. Exasper I'm having an exasperation. You are. I mean, you're having an exacerbation that's exasperating you. But yeah, that is a word. So relapsing remitting MS is a very common way of MS presenting. And we know from times gone by what happens if you don't treat this. We'll talk about that. If you don't treat relapsing or remitting MS, there is a good chance that it develops into secondary progressive MS. And then some people start out with their MS progressing right from the beginning. They don't really have relapses. It just slowly progresses right from the beginning. And then some people can be diagnosed very early with their MS, maybe even just on their MRI scan before they have symptoms. You might have an MRI for some unrelated reason, and we see signs of MS. That's called a radiologically isolated syndrome. Or you might have the very first episode we call a clinically isolated syndrome. So now we, have, we know about the common types of MS. We know about very early stages of MS. And we know about the progressive type of MS. And your symptoms will help tell us some of this. And here are some of the symptoms of MS. All the things I talked about. All these symptoms could be stable. They could fluctuate. They could progress. And this is a list of the symptoms. We're not discussing symptoms at any length tonight. But any one of these could constitute the symptoms of MS. MS is a disease of the central nervous system. That means MS can affect the brain and the spinal cord and the optic nerve. So anywhere along those pathways, uh, you could have symptoms. And that is why MS can cause widespread symptoms. That's why sometimes when people have nonspecific symptoms and they go to the internet, they come up with MS very frequently. And then never forget the invisible symptoms of MS. Very disabling symptoms. In fact, many people lose employment because of these symptoms rather than all those visible symptoms on the previous page. So don't forget about pain and fatigue and cognitive problems, the symptoms that might be invisible. These are the symptoms where someone might think that you have psychological problems, or you're lazy, or you're not trying, because they can't see these symptoms. But they're very real symptoms. And what this slide says over here is that Trials have been done in people with the earliest signs of MS, so-called clinically isolated syndrome. CIS is the very early stage of MS. And if you take people with the very first stage of MS and put them on medications, they do better than people that delay taking their medications. So if you look at them, two, if you start someone on a medication two years later, they don't do as well as the people that started the medication early on. So we stress that people should start medication early. It's very important. And even if you look at them 10 years later in some of the trials, the people that started medication early were still doing better. And what are the goals of our treatment? So when you start a new medication, 
or when you go to the neurologist's office and you're trying to decide if your medication is working for you, we have the same sets of me measurements that we're going to use every time. And this is maybe a very important slide for you always to think about. How do I know if my drug is working? What is the effect on relapses? Are you having relapses? Are you becoming more disabled? How about the effect on the MRI scan? How does my MRI scan look? Is it the same? Is it worse? And then we're trying to prevent morbidity from the symptoms, reduce the side effects of the MS. We have to make sure at the same time you're taking your medication, and we want, if we can, to get long-term effectiveness and safety. So these are the goals of our treatment that we're looking at. We want to give you a drug that reduces relapses, slows disability, has positive benefits in your MRI, but importantly, that maybe have long-term efficacy and safety, and that you're going to take, something you're going to take. You're going to stick to it. You're going to comply with it. There's some risk factors. There's some ways we might know. So you might say, okay, I've been diagnosed with MS. How do I know how my MS is going to do? You can look at this slide. And all these slides, of course, as Stuart said, everything over here is recorded. It's all going to be on YouTube, so you can look at this in more detail. But particularly if someone is newly diagnosed or early, there are some ways that we can predict to some degree how the MS course will be. Now, this doesn't always hold. There are people that could start out with a very mild episode and then all of a sudden have a bad outcome, or the opposite can happen. The first episode could be scary, and then all of a sudden the MS settles down. So those can happen. But typically, some of the things that we're going to look at early on are these things, age at onset. So typically, an older age of onset, disease a little more progressive. The symptoms at onset are important. If the symptom at onset is optic neuritis, that would be a good first symptom to pick. If the first symptom at onset is involvement of the brain stem or the spinal cord, not as good an outcome. And then how the MRI scan looks is important. The number of lesions you have gives us some predictability about what the outcome is going to be. And then how long between the first two attacks and how many attacks early on. So these are all things we look at. You'll see there's six criteria all together. So if you have frequent attacks early on, short periods between them, and they have affected your brain stem and your spinal cord, this is an aggressive type of MS that we need to treat aggressively. This is showing you something about the brain scan over here. What this shows you, if you look on the left-hand side, is that if someone has their first episode of MS, and we do, for example, let's take optic neuritis. You have optic neuritis, and we do a brain scan, and there are no lesions, zero lesions on the brain scan, what is your risk of developing MS over the next 10 years or so? About 20%. So even if your scan is normal, there's still some risk for MS. However, what happens if you have one lesion? It jumps up, even one lesion gives you a risk of 80%. So if you have an early symptom of MS and an abnormal scan, even one lesion indicates a high risk for developing definite MS, meaning you're going to have further and ongoing symptoms of MS. So the next thing we look at is the number of lesions, because what we found from that is that the more lesions you have, the more disabled you're going to be down the road, say, 10 years later. So that's what the number of lesions. So even one lesion tells us that there's likelihood of more symptoms of MS, and if there's many lesions, it tells us that the course is probably going to be more active. So now we have some ways of predicting how you're going to be and starting early on to talk to you about what type of medication should we be talking about. We're getting an indication from all these things. How aggressive is your MS? We're trying to personalize your treatment for you, and this helps us in a way. What happens in MS if you don't take treatment? How do we know this? Because I've just told you how important it is to take treatment. So we know this from studies that were done in the old days. What's the old days with MS? MS of the, is, is a disease of the last 20 years where we've really been able to do something. The first approved drug for MS was Betaseron. It just turned 22 years old this month. So if we were sitting here talking in 1992 or 1985, we have nothing. We wouldn't be talking about any of these drugs. I'm not sure what we'd be talking about. We'd have dinner and go home. Probably there was nothing, much to do. Quick dinner, talk about symptoms maybe. Not, nothing much else to talk about. Now we can talk about a whole bunch of drugs. So as a whole revolution in the treatment of relapsing forms of MS. Unfortunately, with progressive forms of MS, we are still quite limited. But what this shows you is that in 1990, the Mayo Clinic did a study, and other places have done studies, and they said about 10 to 20% of people have benign MS. And so these are people that have had MS for 10 years. That's the only way. We can't always predict that at the beginning. 10 years of MS and minimal findings after 10 years, maybe benign MS. And then about 5% of people, if you look right at the bottom over here, about 5% of people could have, well, the second bullet point actually, 5% of people have malignant MS, which is rapidly progressive MS, where people are rapidly disabled, wheelchair, bedridden maybe, rapid progression. 
So most people are in the middle of this bell curve, and these people, we see the following, that 15 years after the diagnosis, 50% of people have progressed, and 25 years after the diagnosis, 80% of people have progressed. Now, you could say 25 years, that's a long time. I'm worried about today, not 25 years. But if you think about that, the average age of onset of MS is 20 to 40. We're talking about someone who could be disabled by, say, 45 to 60. You know, still very important years in, in our lives. So this is very important to know that if we don't treat MS, there's a high likelihood of some, of some progression of the disease. And this slide over here really is the one that is uh, most remarkable, not because it's got so many colors. Um, <laughs> But because of the fact that the first drug approved for MS beta serum was in 1993, and this, again, slide would have been blank before that. So the first medications we had were injectables. So in the orange color are all the injectable medications. Let's see, uh, I, I did this late at night. Hopefully, I got them all right. Um, so the, uh, the injectable medications, the interferons and copaxone were the first medications. And the latest one of those is plegrity, which is another form of interferon. And those are all in orange. The infusible drugs are the ones in the blue. The first one was Novantron. It's a chemotherapy drug. It's quite toxic. I have not used it for years because of its toxicity. But the major advance in infusion drugs was Tysabri, and more recently, the latest infusion medication, uh, Lemtrada. And then, as you see here, we have three oral medications, Jelenia, Obagio, and Tecfidera came out in that order. And so now we have options. We can do injections. We can do orals. We can do infusions. We know something about your MS. We know about your MRI scans. What are we trying to get at? We're trying to personalize the treatment for you. What is the best medication for you, if we can? We can't pick it exactly, but we're trying to pick the drug that's going to work best for you with all these options that we have. And on the top right over there, you see two drugs that are in clinical trials that are close to, being, to going forward, maybe even to being considered by the FDA. So we have all together, then there's 12 there, 14 14 medications, and of course, Copaxone is now three times a week instead of once a week, as it's been for the last 20 years. So there's going to be many, many options. How do we make a decision? I've spoken to you about some of the things we look at. How aggressive do we think your MS is going to be? Do you like an oral medication? Do you prefer, do you prefer an oral to an injectable? Do you want an infusion? But these are some of the things that come into making the decision. So every time you're thinking of a medication, these are thoughts that should come to your mind. What's the safety of the medication? What's the efficacy of it? What's the tolerability of it? So if you're starting the medication or you're switching from one medication to another, these are things you're going to think about and must discuss with your neurologist. How safe is this drug? You might say, well, I have aggressive MS. I'm really not doing well. My scan looks terrible. I need to be on a drug and I can deal with, I want more efficacy and I'm prepared to deal with some safety issues. So safety is important. Efficacy, how well does this drug work? And tolerability, what are the slight effects? Will I get flu-like reactions? What kind of side effects? So those are all important things to think about. You might have preferences, like I said before, injections. What's the evidence for each of the drugs? I just want to base it on evidence. Does your healthcare provider have experience? That's going to be important when we have 15 drugs. You might, if a neurologist has five patients with MS, he might say, I have everybody on Copaxone. Clearly, that's, then if, you, if you're beyond that stage, you need to go and see someone who has more expertise. So that's very important. How does the drug work? We looked before at all, those, at all those different drugs. They work quite differently. That's the good thing about them. If one type of drug doesn't work, maybe a drug with a different mechanism of action will offer you something else. So how the drug works could be important. Pregnancy issues, MS is a disease that's more common in females, and it's seen in people 20 to 40, childbearing age. It's always important to think about the, the, the pregnancy issues and to discuss contraception and always be ahead of that. How about these two on the bottom, on the bottom right? Cost and convenience. So yes, the convenience is important to you, and the cost is important too, especially to insurance companies, and we fight them all day long. All day we fight them. We prescribe a drug and they say no. For what reason? No, well, there's no reason. Let me tell you the worst example of an insurance company. I have a patient that's in a wheelchair, and the wheel is broken, so it needs to be repaired. He has to get authorized from the insurance company to get the chair repaired. Now, I can't even believe that that has to happen, that you have to call the insurance company to get the chair repaired. Guess what? They declined it. They, they declined. Is it medically necessary to have the chair repaired? I mean, it's unbelievable. You, it's hard to believe these stories. You can't even make these things up. I don't know who to call. Maybe the president. I don't know who can help us with this. 
So they say, okay, first thing you have to do is you have to prove that, it's, that the manufacturer's warranty has expired. Okay, I'll go and get the certificate. I've got all day, of course. I've got nothing else to do. I'll, let's go. I'll go and get the manufacturer's warranty. That's good. Great. Prove that. Okay, now you have to tell us what the cost is. Well, all right, I'll go and do an assessment. You know, I can assess all kinds of things, wheelchairs, houses, car, whatever you want. I'm an assessor. That's my second job. I mean, it's unbelievable what they want. So you can imagine when we're talking about a drug that costs $60,000 a year, how ridiculous that they are sometimes. And then the monitoring and the screening is the final point over here. You might say, oh, this drug requires too much testing, or you have to go and see an ophthalmologist or somebody else. So these are all the things. So when we're picking, thinking of a drug for you, when you're thinking of a drug for yourself, it's not just a simple thing like picking out a kit and saying, oh, I like this. It's not going to take one minute. You're not going into Nordstrom Rack and say, wow, that's a cool shirt. I'll take that one. It's not like that. And it shouldn't be like that. It should be something that requires some thought. We should be thinking about this and spending some time thinking about that. This went through the pattern of symptoms again. The reason I put this up again is because the pattern of symptoms might tell us what kind of MS you have. For example, if you're coming in and you're having a progression, and you say, I haven't been to see you for six months, but I'm getting worse, I might start to be concerned about whether there could be a progressive type of MS. And the drugs we're talking about are all for relapsing forms of MS. For progressive MS, we have to em emphasize your symptom management. How do we manage your symptoms? That's what we're emphasizing for the progressive type of MS. But all the rest of it could fit in with a relapsing form of MS. So now, when we start the medication, we deal with all those things, we want to switch. What are the things we look at? Remember what I said before, the same things. Let's see, are you having relapses? Is that why you need to switch? You're having a relapse. Your medication might not be working. Or your disability is worse, or the MRI is worse. So these are all ways we're measuring if the drug could be working for you. So we look at these three things first. So basically the way I look at this is you come in and you give me a report, I examine you and we look at your MRI. Three things, a little triangle of three things that we're gonna decide how well is this drug working for you. What do you report to me? What do I find? What does the scan say? That's one way we're gonna look at you. But we can look at other things as well besides safety and efficacy and tolerability. Can you tolerate the drug? You might say I've got welts and red spots and tolerability issues. And again, this cost and convenience and what's on the formulary for your insurance company so these are some of the things that we use in making our decision as to when to switch your drug. What is a relapse? It's important to define a relapse. It's important particularly for those of us who do clinical trials that every neurologist is on the same page and means the same thing. So a relapse can either be a new symptom or a worsening of a prior symptom. But the key thing about it is it must last for at least 24 hours. So if, 15, if your left hand was tingling for 15 minutes, that is not a relapse. If you had blurry vision for seven and a half minutes, that's not a relapse. That's not a relapse, that's something else. And in an older MS patient, remember other things can cause these symptoms. So if I have an MS patient that's older, I have to think about other things. You could have a pinched nerve in your back. There could be a side effect due to a medication. It could be a stroke. There could be many other things going on beside MS. So it must last for at least 24 hours with no other explanation. And one of the major things that mimic a relapse is fever. So if you have a fever, a urinary tract infection, an upper respiratory infection, any one of these things, when people have fever, you have a urinary tract infection, your temperature goes up, guess what? You feel much weaker. And this is something I've seen often. So if I get a call on a Friday night, so that's the typical time for someone to get a relapse, right? Friday night at 6 o'clock or during the Dolphin game, something like that. So that's when people will call and say, okay, I'm feeling very weak, I can't walk. So I'm um, first thing I'm probably going to say, go to the ER and check you. you can, let's, let's get a urinalysis. That's one of the things I want to... Please don't call me during the Dolphin Games or the Marlin Games. I'm depressed enough anyway. So is it a relapse or a pseudo-relapse? We have to determine that. Is it a relapse or a pseudo-relapse? And so do you have fever? You might have started a new medication for your bladder and it's made you dizzy, made you lightheaded. So there are many other things we should think about them. So the answer for you calling and saying, I can't walk, is not for me to say, okay, here's some solumedrol, call me on Monday. It's to say, could there be something else going on? Determine if it's a relapse or a pseudo-relapse. We talked about the progression of disability. Is it progressing with relapses? Are you getting worse, but you've had relapses, and you still have a relapsing form of MS, or could you have a progressive type of MS? And let's be realistic about what kind of treatment op options we can offer you as to then what type of MS is it. So we look at the MRI scans, and we look at pretty much, again, on the MRI scan, you look at three things you're going to look at, go and look at your scan, put it up in, on the computer in front of you, and you're going to look for the white spots, the lesions, or plaques, whatever name you want to call them. We, call them. we can call them, typically, you might call them T2 lesions. You see white spots on the scan, 
And the neurologist will show you these T2 lesions. They're scars. They could be signs of inflammation. They could be scars. It could be a number of things. But you're going to look at them and say, oh, are there any new T2 lesions? And you're going to look for T1 lesions. We call those black holes. Those are signs of permanent damage, atrophy, damage on the brain. So you want to see, are there new T1 lesions on my brain scan? And finally, you do, we give you contrast. And that's to show us if there's enhancing or active lesions. When we give you contrast, that shows if lesions on the brain are active. And these are all things we want to know about with MS. So I like these things in threes. We're gonna, you're going to give me the history, the relapses. We're gonna look, you're going to get an examination, disability, and the MRI scan. The MRI scan, three things we're going to look at. T1, T2, and gadolinium enhancing lesions. And then we make a decision and say, okay, we have now decided it's time for us to switch to a different drug based on a failure of your last drug or a lack of uh, tolerability of your last drug or, all right, so safety or efficacy or tolerability. Those three things are things we're going to look at to know that your drug's not working, and then we're going to try and pick a new drug for you. Well, is it easy to pick a new drug? We have to know all about you. And so this is part two, how we're going to go into the importance of knowing all about you. What other diseases do you have? That could be important. What's your medical and family history? What's your risk tolerance? JC virus antibodies. How's your immune system? Many other things you want to know about you. And here's a long list. Don't look at, just look at the length of it. You don't even have to look at what it is. It's all these things impact what we have to do. For example, do you have liver problem? How many MS drugs can potentially affect the liver? How many? Yes, right. Almost all of them. We have to monitor the liver and your blood count. And what about depression? Is depression common in MS? So if a drug increases that risk, we should consider things like that. Have you had infections, hematologic disorders? What's your past history? All these things are very important, so we have to know your history. And does it impact on your lifestyle? Do you travel? What's your age? Are you in a childbearing age? Pregnancy issues. Employment, could the drug affect that? What's your employment situation? How's your support system? Finances, compliance. So all these things are very important things in deciding what to switch. And then how do you monitor for the drug? So what do you need to do? Do you need to do blood tests? and liver tests, and thyroid tests? Do you have to see a cardiologist? Do you have to see an ophthalmologist? Things like that are all very important to know. And what's the safety of the drug and the tolerability? This is a summary, pretty much, of many things you have to go through, and some of the side effects just bunched together from, from a series of different drugs. It just shows you how many things that we should be considering when we're thinking about these medications. Polypharmacy. Well, if you didn't know what polypharmacy was before, now you're going to see it there. You could be taking many different medications. You could be taking something from your, for your MS. So you're taking one of the MS drugs. And then you're taking something for your symptoms. Well, some people like medications and some don't. Some who do could be taking a whole bunch of medications. You're taking something for your bladder. You're taking something for pain. You're taking something for depression. You're taking something for spasticity, for anxiety. I mean, before you turn around, you're on five, six drugs plus your MS drug. And on top of that, you might have another condition. You're diabetic. You have hypertension. Guess how many medications you're taking very soon? And could they interact with each other? Of course. So we have to always think about that. Whoever starts you on a new drug is responsible. The pharmacy, I guess, these days often will check that. You could check it yourself. You can go online. Just type into Google somewhere, interaction, drug interaction checker. You'll find it yourself and be surprised. Most of the time when I do the drug interaction checker, guess what I find? The drugs I'm putting them on have no effect, but there's two drugs they're taking somewhere else that are causing problems. So it's very important to check for interactions. And this just shows you a list. Again, it's going to be on YouTube. I don't expect you to look at this. It's just showing you the extent of it. Look at this list of drugs that you could be taking for all these things over here and that they could be interacting with each other and causing problems. So it's very, very important when we're switching you to these medications and talking about medications to make sure that, these, that there's no major interactions. And this is because you could have other chronic diseases. You could be diabetic, for example. You could have chronic pain. And different people are giving you different drugs. So it's important always to look at this. Uh, patients metabolize drugs differently. Uh, some older patients might metabolize drugs differently from a younger patient. Uh, patients might not be following up and not, might not be compliant with their follow-up. And we miss something. Uh, if you have lab work done you need, and you don't get a result, you need to call for the result. So. For, for those who know me, what I say about no news? No news is what? No news is no news. No news is not good news. And no news is not bad news. No news is no news. So for example, you go off and you get your lab work done and, and, you, and two weeks later you haven't heard. So oh, that's great. I suppose my vitamin D is great. I haven't heard from the doctor. He's, you know, 
probably taken off to the beach already. Um, no, no news is no news. You just must assume, if you haven't heard from, from, from your doctor that maybe they didn't get the result, well, unless they communicate with you in some other way. But I'm saying, if you haven't heard within two weeks, call. Because sometimes these labs don't send the results to us. And then we need to be, that needs to shake us up a little bit too. You know, when we were looking for, for tens and hundreds, or hundreds of lab results coming in, sometimes you could, you could miss something. Of course, if it's a very urgent thing, we're going to be right on top of it. But for routine things, if you haven't heard, what's your vitamin D? How's your liver? How's your blood count? If you haven't heard, you must call. So uh, where is Stuart hanging out? Okay, Stuart, that's the, that's the end of part one. So that's the end of part one. So part one was talking to you about, about your medications, how you pick medications, how important it is to look to know everything else about you, how they all interact with each other, and the importance of being on top of this. And part two is going to be our new discussion. So that's the end of part one. Thank you. Uh, so part two is something excuse me, you've all seen this program that Stuart has set up, MS Views and News. You, most of you, I'm sure, all of you, look up get the regular emails, you look for stuff on the internet. If you miss a meeting, you can go to YouTube, you can look something up. You can see what I've spoken about. But in addition to that, you can go and see what many other neurologists have spoken about. Some very prominent neurologists in other states that also treat MS. So you don't always have to hear what I say. You can go and see what other people say as well. And this is all on YouTube. There is Dr. Leganke from Alabama who has a huge clinic in Alabama. There's people from Charlotte, North Carolina. There's Atlanta, there's Orlando, there's Jacksonville. And Stuart even went to Chicago recently. So all over the place, you could go to YouTube and you could look for different people's takes on different drugs, look at dietary aspects and all kinds of things like that. That's already there. That's on YouTube. So we've talked about, and I've worked with Stuart, and said, you know, what can I contribute to this going forward? And how can we expand the program? And one of the things that's always been very important to me is communication. You know, I've talked about that often when I get the opportunity to talk about the importance of communication and the importance of the visit, your visit to your physician's office. So that's a half hour. When is, how long is that? How much time do you have with your physician, really? So patients with MS actually get longer visits than, than most than people. So I look in my office and other neurologist's office, an average patient that has dizziness or some or headaches gets 15 minutes. And you're in and you're out. It's not very long. MS patients take 30 minutes or even longer sometimes. Part of that is because they have many problems. They're more complex. Some of it is cognitive related, but they tend to get a longer time. Whatever it is though, even let's say it's 30 or 40 minutes, it's 30 or 40 minutes in six months. So in, in 30 minutes or 40 minutes, you have to discuss a lot of issues. So that visit needs to be prepared for. And so step one of preparing for that visit is this item that we're gonna show you over here. And for some of you who come to my office, quite a few come to my office, and when you come in, we always give you a form to fill in. It's two pages, and it's, this is a version of page one that's up there. We'll discuss page one and page two. And the purpose of that is to make your visit special and to get the most out of your visit. That's what the purpose of this form is. Now, in, in the old days in my office, when people left and went, and they were given the form, and we said, take it home and fill it in and then come in. This is a form I want you to think about. This is not something that you should come to the office and say, oh, I forgot my form, I'll fill it in now in five minutes. Five minutes is a waste of time for you, and it's a waste of time for me. Really, I want to do the most for you, and so you have to spend some time the night before, the week before, filling this kind of form in, so when you come in, we know all kinds of things about you, and why you're here, and what the problems are. And I love it when you come in and say, annual checkup, no problems, that's great, but that may, may often is not the case. So if you look at this form on top, and I think you all have this, everyone have this form? You all have this? <clears throat> so we call this the Land of MS Communication Tool, and it's going to go onto the MS Views and News webpage. You'll see it there. So now what you can do is you can print it out two or three days before you come in. You have to print it out. We have no way of, this, of you filling this in and then sending it to your physician's office. You print it out. You may have a way. You could fax it or something. But you print this form out before you go to the office. And then you spend some time looking over it, so when you go in, everything is accurate. So, for example, it says on top, we ask you about when your last visit is. Well, that might not be that important. I know that, but if the, is there a change of your insurance? This is a frustrating thing sometimes. So you come in, and I want to give you a new prescription, and I'm about to send off for a refill for your drug, and guess what? Your insurance has changed. 
So how much time are we going to waste? Now, establishing that there's a change in your insurance and calling the medical assistant and doing all that stuff that we should do right at the beginning and get it done and out the way and not even have to spend 13 seconds. So let's put these basic facts in your insurance and your pharmacy. And then why are you here today? What is the reason for your visit? Now, this is where you tell us why you're here. Annual checkup, new tingling, bladder problems, sleep problems, depression. You write that in that section that says why are you here and what are your questions. So I look at that in one and a half seconds and I know immediately what most of our discussion is going to be. It makes it a valuable discussion. If you write nothing there and I have to extract it from you, like extracting a tooth, it's going to waste time because we all have only so much time. So it's very important that we know why you're here that day. So write it in there. This is what I look at in one second. Then all your symptoms are listed underneath that. So we went before through the neurological symptoms. So this talks about all of them. Do you have any numbness, weakness, dizziness, gait problems, balance problems, vision problems, double vision, fatigue, memory problems? So these are some of the highlighted neurological symptoms. I want you to write these down. Now they could be the same as before. They could be new. They could be changed, they could be unchanged, they could be constant, all those things we talked about before. Give me an indication of what your symptoms are. I'm going to look at that too, that's very important. And then next, list all medications and supplements. A most important section. So I spent five minutes talking to you before end of ten minutes about your medications and drug interactions and polypharmacy. Does everyone remember that section ten minutes ago? I hope so. It's very important. So one of the most frustrating things to me is when people write for medications and supplements, the same or unchanged. I went to the pharmacy to Walgreens and I said, can I get the same? And the guy looked at me, he said, what's the same? I said, I don't know, my patient takes the same and they feel good. <laughs> what is the same? I don't know what the same is or unchanged. I said, okay, if you haven't got the same, give me unchanged. He said, we don't have that either. We don't have the same or we don't have unchanged. I said, oh, sorry. And then I walked out of there, you know, not feeling very smart. You have to write everything down. Please write them down. Write all your medications. And so what I see on the list over here is a list of medications, Avanax. Oh, so that's all you're taking is Avanax? Your blood pressure's under control? You're, oh, no, no, I take for my blood pressure. I, I just thought you wanted to know about my neurological medications. Okay, let's just talk about everything above your neck then. I don't want to hear anything below your neck. No. Write all your medications down. How about your supplements? Vitamin D. Are you taking your vitamin D? Oftentimes to me when I don't see something, it means out of sight, out of mind, you're probably not taking it. I guarantee half the time it means that someone's not taking their medication. So write everything down, all your medications, all your supplements. I saw someone the other day that I had been given Elevil. She'd been taking Elevil. Elevil is an old medication. It's been around for years as an antidepressant. People take it for sleep, it's used for, for treating nerve pain, it's got many uses. It's an old drug that's still quite valuable. Well, all, all, all antidepressants potentially can lower the seizure threshold a little bit. Now, if you look up in the prescribing information for interferons, you'll see it says warning seizures. Very low risk, but it says it. Now you go and see the psychiatrist and say you're depressed and the psychiatrist doesn't do due diligence and says, okay, we're going to give you Wellbutrin. Guess what Wellbutrin does to the seizure threshold? So now you're taking three drugs, and soon there could be four drugs for causing seizure problems. And you could have a seizure. And I just happened to a patient of mine the other day, ended up in Boca ER with a seizure, with a whole combination of medications. So we need to know about all your medications that you're taking, every one of them, every time. That's why I want you to print this out before you come for your visit. Print this out ahead of time. And then when you come in, we can look at this list, and we can see if there are interactions and prevent any side effects from the interactions. And then the lab work and the MRI, those are things we're always going to have on file, but if you remember where they are, you can put those down. The bottom one, it says, have you missed any of your regular prescribed medications or injections? This is the section for, are you telling the truth? I hope so. And people, not always. So, the time, so compliance and adherence in MS are very important topics. People don't always take their medications, sometimes especially when they feel good. Well, I've been taking this medication every day, but I feel good. I think I can probably reduce it to every other day. And guess what? It doesn't work anymore. So, for example, Tecfidera is one of the drugs for MS that you take twice a day as a pill. Guess what? If you take it once a day, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So take the medications as prescribed. 
And there are studies that have been done that shown that people with MS, after a while, get tired of their medications. And this doesn't only apply to the injectables, where there's a lack of adherence and a lack of compliance. This also applies to oral medications. People don't take them oftentimes, maybe even up to 50% of people as prescribed. So we want to know about all that. Very important. So that's page one. Can we, can we, oh, I've got the control here, I guess. Where is it? Page two. Okay, page two is very important. So the first part of page two is social history. So we want to know how you're doing. Are you working? Are you able to work part-time or full-time? What's your work status? So just a general question to know how you're functioning. Then it says, do you smoke? So smoking is not good for MS. Are you surprised? No. But there are studies that have been done that show that smoking actually increases the risk of progression if you have MS. So I don't want you only to stop smoking because you might get lung cancer or heart disease or some other form of cancer. Yeah, I mean, all those things are good things to avoid. Would you, would you agree? But it's bad for MS2, and studies have shown it's clearly bad for MS2. So here's an opportunity for me when I see that to tell you to stop smoking. I mean, it hardly ever works, but I'm still going to try. I won't give up. And then it says, have you tried to quit and so on? Alcohol. What about alcohol and MS? Well, Stuart gave you the shirt over here. Okay, we have to be a little light. You know, we have to be able to laugh at ourselves sometimes. And actually, if you, in, in, on my business card, on the back of my business card, it's, there is a heading and it says MS identification card. And it, we write your name and it says, you know, it says the following person, Tom Brady has MS, and it's got lists all the symptoms that you might have. Whatever your name is, it lists the symptoms. Why? Because I've had patients that have had trouble because they've been pulled over, and somebody will say, let's see you walk in a line, and they can't because they've got MS, not because they're drunk. And so it's very important to identify that, that people with MS have trouble walking, and therefore, because you're vulnerable to your walking problem, you shouldn't drink because then it's definitely going to be worse. So balance problems are common in MS, and if you drink too much alcohol, it's going to make it worse. So we know that alcohol, too much alcohol is bad on the brain too, so just be careful with alcohol as well. Caffeine, caffeine could be a stimulant, so caffeine might be good for MS as a stimulant. At the same time, it's a diuretic and it could push your bladder. So we have to balance that up. Drugs, are you taking drugs? We need to know about that. This could be marijuana. This is a controversial topic in MS. It's got some benefits, it's got some downsides. In the state of Florida, it's moot. It's not, it's not, it's not approved, but it may be a topic we're gonna to talk about in, in the future. And exercise. Exercise is very important, of course. Keep moving. And you read about this all the time, the importance of keeping moving. So sometimes people say, oh, I can't move. I'm too fatigued. I can't do exercise. When I do exercise, I'm too tired. So I said, how long did you do? 20 minutes. Well, try 10 minutes next time. You need to keep exercising. You need to keep moving. There's multiple studies. I'm not just making this up. There are multiple studies that have been shown the importance of exercise keeping yourself moving. And if you're in a wheelchair or you're sitting in a chair, you can still move. Move the parts that move. Move whatever you can. Do a little bit of movement every day. If you're lucky and you can do more, do more. But some movement is very important. Physical exercise is very important for you. That's why I'm asking the question here, do you exercise? We could put in there too, mental exercise. How about on the previous page, we asked you about your memory. Are memory problems common in MS? Yeah, they're not always serious or severe but probably at least two-thirds of patients with MS have some problems with their memory and their cognition. And how do we improve that? Anybody got ideas of how we can improve your memory? Yeah, you could do a crossword puzzle. One thing you can do is take a drug for it. There are no good medications for your memory. There are medications that have been used for Alzheimer's disease that have been tried for MS. Quite frankly, a waste of time and money. So you have to do other things. You have to do mental stimulation. And you have to do physical exercise. Physical exercise also benefits your memory. And guess what? As we go down a little lower, you're going to see we're going to talk about your mental health. So depression, common in MS, yes. More common in MS than in other chronic diseases. How do we help depression? Again, we could take medications. Or we could try and stay away from medications. And we could say, okay, we're going to do exercise. Helps you. So I had a patient the other day, and she said, she, she's, every time she wants to exercise, she feels depressed and she goes and lies in bed. Or she eats something. I said to her, you're opening the wrong door. I said, if you feel depressed, you don't open the refrigerator door. That is the wrong door. 
Go and open the front door and take a little walk. Walk around the block. Walk outside. Watch some birds in the trees. Look at some flowers. Do something. So when you feel depressed and down, the answer is not to go to bed. The answer is to open a different door, which is the front door or some other door, and to make yourself a little, get yourself a little bit of stimulation instead of just lying in bed. Go and do a little bit of exercise. Do five minutes of exercise. That's the type of thing to do if there's some, if there's some, if you're feeling down and depressed, go and do something. Open the right door. So we even have put on here psychological problems. We want to know about those to see if we can help you. How much stress do you have? And we give you a rating over here, a lot of stress. Many people have a lot of stress, and so we need to try and help you with that. And we may say, okay, let's see how we can help you with the stress. Could it be financial problems, personal problems, you know, medical problems? What is the problem that's causing your stress, and how can we help you? We might refer you to a social worker, to a counselor, to a psychiatrist. We're going to try and help you be referred somewhere. And even over here, we're asking you about community resources. Do you need resources? What kind of resources do you need? And we sometimes can help. Again, maybe it's through a social worker. So we're going to ask you those questions. And how is your life? What can we do to improve it? So you fill all these things in over here, just like I said on the prior page. When I look at all these things, within a short time, I'm immediately able to see where is the path, where, what, what, what track is our visit going to go today so we can make the most of this visit and not waste time. We don't want to waste time with a visit. We don't have a lot of time. So I've told you this story before. This is another door issue. I told you about the first door. The first door is the refrigerator door that you keep closed, and the front door should be open and you go out and do some exercise. But there are, there are other doors that we can think about over here when we're talking about quality of life, opportunities, things like that. Writing all this down, saying to at the end of your visit, okay, now the visit's over, you walk out the door, and you're standing at the door, and you've had 35 and a half minutes, and you're standing at the door, ah, oh, I forgot to ask you about my bladder. One more question, my bladder problem. Well, a bladder problem is not a one-minute question ever. Unless I say, that's the bathroom over there, I could do that. A bladder problem is complex, it needs to be written down here, so you never have, we don't want, nothing is a one-second problem, there's no such thing as a one-second problem. Write them down. We don't want door questions. The door should be, okay, let's go up and come back in three months or six months. That's what the door is. Okay. And then there's uh, review of symptoms. Oh, okay, that came out a little different on here, I guess, than it is on here. Over here, you saw we put a bunch of boxes, and this is review of symptoms. And this is the same as the previous page where I talked to you about the same and the unchanged. I don't want to know about same and unchanged. I want to know what they are. So mental health is very important in MS whatever it may be, confusion, anxiety, depression, sleep disorder. How about sleep disorder? You say, I'm not sleeping well, right? If it's 4.49 in the afternoon and there's an important meeting I have to go to, I might say, here, take Ambien and come back in three months. That's the wrong approach. I should say, why are you, what is your sleep disorder? Why are you not sleeping well? It's another complex issue. You might not be sleeping well because your bladder is a problem again. <coughs> And it's waking you up and you're getting up all night, so you're disturbed, so you're exhausted the next day. So you're fatigued and you're not sleeping well because of your bladder. Or it could be pain. You might not be sleeping well because you've got pain. Or you could have depression. There could be many reasons why you're not sleeping well and we need to evaluate them. You might need to go for a sleep study. Maybe you've got sleep apnea. I don't, there could be many problems and we need to say, what's the problem so we treat it properly? So to give you Ambien or to simply give you something for your fatigue is wrong, we need to see is there, a, is there a secondary cause for your sleep problem or your fatigue that we need to be addressing. And if you're fatigued and exhausted and tired, guess what? You have cognitive problems too. So do you see how all these things can interact with each other? And so it's important for us to get to the root of it. And when you start filling this in, it helps us get to the root of it and get more effective treatment of the problem. The next session, a very important session, is the bladder session. People with MS have frequent bladder problems. They wake up at night, it disturbs them. And there are different types of bladder problems. Some people have frequency and urgency. When they gotta go, they gotta go. And if they don't get there in time, they might leak. Some people get the opposite. They can't empty their bladder. They will go, they feel a need to go, and they get there, and their bladder won't empty. They have hesitancy or difficulty emptying their bladder. And their bladder can be full of urine and they get infections, recurrent infections. And we spoke early, right at the beginning, about what's the effect of infections on people. Makes them sick. They get pseudo relapses. They can get more than that. They can get a true relapse from infection too. And if the infection is not treated, guess where it goes from the bladder? To the kidney. 
And if it goes from the kidney, guess where it can go? And so people that have more severe MS can, can actually, this can be a very serious event if they get an infection in their blood, and it often will start in the bladder in someone with MS. So the bladder problems are very important, and going with that, all the other things related to that, sexual dysfunction, all these are important problems. And then gastrointestinal. I'm talking about gastrointestinal here from the standpoint of bowel control, diarrhea, constipation, incontinence, things like that. If someone's very constipated, they could potentially get rectal bleeding. The bowel or the gut and MS are going to be important in the future. You might have read in the past few weeks, there's more and more written about the microbiome. <coughs> Has anyone read about the microbiome? Who knows about the microbiome? Microbiome. I'm looking for somebody. Going, going, $5, $10, nobody. Microbiome, yeah. Excellent, thank you. The microbiome are the bacteria that live in our gastrointestinal tract. So how many bacteria do you think live over here from our throat all the way down to the end, to the, to the rectum? To, how many bacteria do you think they're living there? Maybe a trillion or billions of tiny little organisms living there and they interact with us and they probably interact with our immune system. It's called the microbiome. And there's some studies just published in the last couple of weeks, some very good studies done that showed that there are certain bacteria in people with MS that are more common than, in, than, than people that don't have MS and they're, they're pro-inflammatory. They cause inflammation. And on the other hand, there's bacteria that are very good to have that are less seen in people with MS. So in some way in the future, modifying what we put in our gastrointestinal tract is gonna be very important and our diets might play a greater role actually when we understand that a little more. It might be diets, it might be medications, but the gastrointestinal tract is part of our immune system going forward. And then of course the eyes, we spoke about this topic Dr. K has done this uh, before, and last night we had a whole session talking about the eyes, and the eyes are commonly involved in MS. What's one of the common symptoms of MS? Optic neuritis. But there are other causes of eye problems. Optic neuritis of MS is quite specific. It typically involves one eye, and it's painful, and it often recovers to some extent. So if any of those features don't fit in, it's unusual. If someone has loss of vision in both eyes, this is unusual for MS if it happens at the same time. If someone doesn't have pain, it's unusual for MS. So then there could be atypical features and there could be something else causing an eye problem. There could be glaucoma. There could be something else going on. So eye problems common in MS, but be aware there could be other things. And then the eyes are affected in other ways. For example, there could be double vision as well. There could be other problems as well with the eyes. Respiratory, breathing, we want to know about your breathing. In particular, this comes again into snoring, sleep apnea, uh, very important. Well, you have the rest of this. So the next, the next one is ear, nose, and throat. Loss of voice. Sometimes people will get loss of voice, hoarseness. So these problems we want to know about as well. Hearing loss. Endocrine. Do you have other medical conditions? Diabetes. Thyroid disease. Thyroid disease is common in MS. So we want to know about that. Some medications might actually increase the risk of thyroid disease. Autoimmune thyroid diseases are common. If you have MS, it's not unlikely that you can have other autoimmune diseases, including thyroid diseases. And then cardiovascular, your general health. Do you have high blood pressure, swelling of the feet, shortness of breath? All those symptoms are very important. Hematological, bruising or bleeding. Some drugs have complications. They can affect your blood count. Constitutional symptoms. We want to know about all of these. And they might not be a big part of your visit, but write them all down. There are times when I've seen people that have symptoms that are unrelated to their MS, and I've said, well, you need to go and see so-and-so. I had one particular patient that I was happy with myself for doing this, that the patient had change in bowel habits. <clears throat> change in bowel habits. And so, you know, what did they do? Attributed to your MS. Of course, everything's from MS. If you have a primary care physician that blames everything on MS, you need a new primary care physician. Because you have other diseases. MS is one disease. So we're talking, when we talk about the word holistic, to me the word holistic means you treat your MS, but you treat your whole body. And you don't just take complementary medications or you don't just take your disease modifying drugs for MS. You do them all, everything, together. That's what holistic means to me. So yes, constitutional symptoms, change in bowel habits, all those things could be important. Skin lesions. In the past year, I saw a patient that came to see me and I was just examining her and I saw a dark spot on her arm, on her forearm, and I said, what's that? Oh, she said, I've always had that. I said, that looks very dark. And needless to say, it turned out to be melanoma. That's probably the one time when I saved someone's life. I don't know, I guess in, as an as MS doctor, I don't know if I saved lives, but that's one time I definitely thought I saved that person's life. Musculoskeletal, neck pain and back pain. Yes, common in MS. 
MS doesn't cause neck pain typically or back pain typically, but it's people walk, they have trouble walking, they limp, they favor, they favor one extremity over the other, it puts abnormal mechanical strain on the back, and therefore it's not uncommon to have pain in the back and the joints, and spasms. And then the skin and the skin or breast problems, I spoke about the skin already, there could be other things going on. We have drugs that play with the immune system, we need to monitor the skin. MS is a disease more common in women, so it's not uncommon that there could be breast problems that, that people need to deal with. And then finally, the final, the finally, if you all have the sheet on the bottom left, it says other. If there's something that we forgot about. So remember, this is version 1.0. This is our first version. There may be, as we go along, if you have suggestions for this, like Stuart's given you this form that you can fill in to give us critiques. So if you have suggestions, we welcome them. We'd like to have version 1.1. We're not quite up to version 10 yet, like Microsoft, but we'd like to have version 1.1. So this is a summary of it. Now, the, the final part of this over here that I put on this slide is, so you go through all these things, you write down your symptoms, your medications, your questions, and we go through those things. And the final part that I wrote on this slide is summary. It's good if you can get that, if there's time for that, say, okay, at the end of our visit today, let's go over what we're gonna do. What are our plans for the future? Number one, you're going to take your vitamin D, right? You can take your vitamin D? Okay, good. Number two, you're going for an updated MRI scan, right, yes? And number three, you're gonna stop smoking. Number four, you're gonna exercise, yeah, okay? So this is a summary of your visit. You can discuss that, you can discuss the summary. Uh, sometimes if there's electronic medical records, we can actually print out the plans for you. You can say, I want the, I'm gonna forget. Print it out for me and we can print out plans, those things to do or to ignore. Hopefully you won't choose that. Um, okay, uh, the summary statement. The symptoms, again, many symptoms. Uh, writing down all your medications, this is just summarizing it for you, all your medications, all the supplements. If there's side effects, you tell us. If you're not tell us, if there's a problem, sometimes people stop. Why did you stop your medication? Because my insurance changed. So why didn't you call? Because all this is a competitive business now. Companies have financial plans, and so it's very important we know if there's some insurance issue, let us know. People run out of their medication. Out of their disease modifying drug, Ampira, whatever it is, they run out. They stop, they feel bad, they come in, they feel bad. We need an opportunity to help you with that. So this is just summarizing everything and that's the end of the summary. So uh, Stuart, I'm, Stuart, thank you. So okay, thank you, that, that, that's the end of, of the introduction of the communication tool which I hope all of you will use. Print it out, take it to your neurologist's office. Um, I hope, hopefully they'll look at it and say thank you, this is, this is helpful to me, it's certainly very helpful to me. So it should be helpful to you and to your neurologists. And if you have advice for us or ideas, please tell us. We'd like to go forward and get version 1.1 or 1.2 or whatever. But you will see this appearing on, on MS Views and News. So thank you, doctor. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna go around the room and I'm gonna start, I have to lose some weight. So who's first? Who has a question? What? Back there? Anybody up here? I don't want to go back there yet. Anyone up here have a question? No? All right. We're almost there. It's too loud. Okay. Um, always uh, the doctors talk about vitamin D3 and B12 being very important. Are there any other? I mean, I know all vitamins have some use, but as far as for MS, what other uh, supplements or vitamins? besides the D3 and B12? None. Okay, so the vitamin that we know that is important for MS clearly is vitamin D3, vitamin D3 is important. And there are well done studies, and I'm talking about local studies that have been done in good centers like in Boston that have clearly shown benefit from vitamin D and comparing people on low levels to high levels and showing that people on low levels of vitamin D have more progression than people with high levels. This is well demonstrated now. So vitamin D is essential to, chest, to test for MS and probably other autoimmune diseases. And we're striving, we're aiming for a level of 75. So if you say to me, how much should you take? I don't know. Show me your blood level, then I'll tell you how much you take. And 75 is the level we're aiming for. Now, B12 is important for the nervous system in general. So I want your B12 level as well, just for your general nervous system. As regards other vitamins, just take them in the, rec in the recommended daily allowance. If you go to Google and look for things you should take, you're going to find 250 different things. You don't need them. I mean, I've seen people take extreme amounts of vitamins and things, and... And the best one I saw yesterday was a woman who came to see me and said, 
Uh, she went to the acupuncturist and uh, she was also having problems dealing with heat. So she got a bottle from the acupuncturist and she said, what do I think about this? This is a new supplement they recommended for her. And I said, hmm, let's have a look at this. Considering it's written in Chinese, I can really give you a good opinion on this. I said, I have no clue what's even in here. Maybe there's some, you know, mulch or something. I don't know what's in here. So I can't even give you an opinion on that. So there's lots of things and lots of people pushing things. MS is a chronic disease. People with chronic diseases sometimes get desperate, understandably, and they're victims of scamming all the time. And there's things out there that people will push all day long that really are not good. So be sure what you're taking. But I don't think any other thing. Vitamin D3 and B12 are essential, and it's part of your whole diet, of eating a healthy diet, of avoiding saturated fats, and doing things like that. So I don't think there's any other vitamins. All the others take the recommended daily allowances. Dr. Steingo, you mentioned the MRI as a factor that is used by neurologists to assess the efficacy of medication. My question is, as a general proposition, how long, in general, uh, after a patient starts on a new medication, would you suggest it's appropriate to have an MRI to determine whether it's working? Right, so MRIs are used very frequently early on, when early on in the course of disease, to see how someone's doing. And MRIs are used certainly when you're switching a drug. So if you're gonna switch from one drug to a new drug, we wanna get a baseline MRI at that time, and then repeat it about six to eight months later. Not sooner than that. We wanna give a drug, drug has to have time to work. If you do it two months later and it shows changes, the drug probably hasn't had time to kick in for the most part. So usually about six months is when we're gonna start doing our evaluations. And then after that will depend on how someone's doing. So we might do one at six months, maybe then at 12 months or one and a half years, and then maybe a year later. And the longer we go and the longer someone is stable, the less frequent the MRI scans become. Going back to vitamin D and B12, what is the best type of supplement to take for that? I've been doing the gummy bears and my level's at 70, and Mindy was saying it should be at 80. Yeah, I think, I think you just need a good brand, a good product for, of D3. And then you can monitor it. You go and check three months later, go and check your D level, see if you're absorbing it. Some people don't absorb D very well at all, and then we check their blood level, and they need to take 10,000 units a day. So if you take something that's a, it's a good brand product, just that, that'll be fine. And then check your level. Then we know if it's working for you. No, you can take either. Some people take, don't like pills. They take liquid. So either one is fine. They both work. Um, Dr. Steingo, does um, something happen to your bones or are brittle bones part of MS? Can that be part of it? Well, brittle bones are not a direct part of MS. But remember, firstly, people with MS have had steroids frequently. So if you take a lot of steroids, you can get osteoporosis and other bone complications from taking a lot of steroid. In addition to that, people with MS are often inactive. They don't move around. And moving around is good for your bones. When you sit in one position all the time, your bones thin as well. So there are reasons why people with MS get osteoporosis and brittle bones because of steroids and inactivity. So the steroids, obviously, we try and avoid. Are you really having a relapse so we should give you steroids? Or could there be something else? Number one, and number two, keep active, keep moving. So, that, well, you to take take calcium. You should, yes, the question is, should you take calcium supplements? Take the recommended daily amount, not excessive amounts. The recommended daily amount. If you have a question, please wait for me to get to you with the microphone. And if you have something to add to a question, please wait for me to get to you with the microphone. Um, I'd like to know what are some of the symptom drugs. I I, I only one I know about is Ampera. Um, and so I have some symptoms. I don't know if there are any others that can help you with symptoms. Symptoms of? Uh, numbness, like for instance, is one of my big ones. So? Like I have numbness um, in my feet. Okay. And that's a big issue for me. Well, we can talk about that particular symptom. The question is numbness. So there is no medication for numbness. So when you think about symptoms of the sensory system, which is how you feel things, touching, feeling, two things can happen. You could either feel too much or you could feel too little. So you could have too much sensation. You could have prickling or burning or pins and needles or electrical feelings or you name it. Burning, you know, many different symptoms that you could have. If you have too much symptom, we can help you. There are medications we use for that. I'd mentioned to you before about Elevol, the antidepressant medication and some other antidepressants. 
And the other group of medications for that is anti-seizure medications like gabapentin. So we can help your sensation if you have too much of it or uncomfortable sensations. But if you have no sensation and you can't feel and you're numb, there is no medications that, that, that make you feel more. Repeat what he's saying, please. Yes. We're listening, Stuart. Right. So again, if, if, if there's a, a lack of feeling, we can't do much to improve that. We would teach you to be cautious, watch where you're walking, watch what you touch, and things like that. If the feeling is very uncomfortable and you're hypersensitive, then we might try one of those other methods and remedies that I spoke to you about. Yes, uh, I, a couple of times I've spoken to you about the oral medications, and you kept saying there was some kind of side effects. Are there any drugs that have very little side effects? I mean, there's no drug that has no side effects. So every drug we look at, we've got to review the side effects. There's a safer drug, a safer one? A safer one? Safer oral medication. Yeah, so, no. I mean, if you, the oral medications, uh, I would say, all have different types of side effects. And we have to look at each one of them individually for you and say, what's the right one for you? One of them might cause, for example, a slowing of the heart rate. One of them could be causing liver problems or hair thinning. One of them could cause diarrhea and flushing. They all have different kinds of issues, and we have to see what's best, what's going to be the best match for you. It used to be that uh, Tysabri, that they said that you should only take it two years. Have they extended that now? Yeah, I think with Ty Sabri, what we're learning with time is we're learning how to manage it better, and we know what the risk factors are. The question is, how long can you take Ty Sabri for? So we know some of the risk factors. We know there's basically three risk factors, and the one you're referring to is correct, is the longer you take it, then the higher the risk, especially after the first two years. So in the first two years of Ty Sabri, there's a, there's a much lower risk. After two years, the risk increases of getting PML. That's what we're talking about, the risk of Tysabri of getting PML, which is a virus disease of the brain. That's one risk factor. So the, the length of time you take it is a risk factor. The second risk factor is if someone's had prior chemotherapy. And nowadays, I don't know anybody who'd ever put someone on Tysabri that's had chemotherapy. I wouldn't. And that's two risk factors. And the third risk factor is we can actually measure how much exposure you've had to that virus that causes PML called JC virus. So if you've had a very, if, you're, if your JC virus tests are negative, very low, you have lower risk. Not no risk, there's no such thing as no risk, but it's a very low risk. And the higher the level is of antibodies to the JC virus, the higher your risk. So we would use all these things. And if we have all those things, it's possible you could take Tysabri for four or five years even, or six years. If you're JC virus negative and you've never had chemotherapy, uh, and we're monitoring you carefully, we, we could go on and use it for a longer period of time. This side of the room. When you're on Tecfidera, do you have to be tested for the JC virus? No, there's no evidence for that. So Tecfidera is one of the oral pills that you talked about. Uh, it's actually, I think, the number one pill now in the world. I, th I heard the other day there are over 130,000 people on Tecfidera, which is more than any other drug. And given that, there is one case of PML that's been seen. There's actually one, two cases, one on Tecfidera itself and one on a related compound. So that's two out of 135,000. A large number of people on Tecfidera were on Tysabri and switched to Tecfidera, and we have not seen any problems. So right now, they certainly have no indication. The only indication we have that the FDA changed that originally, in their wisdom, they said check the lymphocyte count or the white blood cell count once a year, and then they changed it and they said, well, do it every six months. Because in the one case that got PML on Tecfidera, the lymphocyte count was low. So if we see someone's lymphocyte counts are dropping and they're too low and they're, and they're persistently low, say under 500, we might say, you know, we're a little wary of this drug. We don't know what that means. Maybe it's not right for you. But I don't think taking, checking the JC virus is going to change our management because, as I said, a lot of people on Tecfidera came from Tysabri. So I don't routinely do that on Tecfidera. I just, but I do monitor the lymphocyte count. That we should be doing the white blood cell count. Hi. Hi. Is there uh, an alternative to MRI testing uh, now, or is anybody looking into that into the future? Well, there's really no alternative to MRI testing. There are a whole bunch of new versions of MRIs, different kinds of MRIs, functional MRIs, and spectroscopic MRIs, and different kinds of MRIs. Uh, 
the MRI can't be used only in a few instances. Number one, you can't take an MRI if you have kidney problems, because when we do the, 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 the dye, that we can do. We could do an MRI, but we can't give you the gadolinium, the dye, which is important. But we could do a regular MRI. Uh, so if you're allergic to the dye, we can't do that. If you've got kidney problems, we can't give you the dye. We can still do MRIs. But some stimulators that go in the body or pacemakers, you can't use an MRI. A CAT scan is pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, a waste of time for MS. So the MRI was actually a huge advance in our diagnosis of MS. Other than that, we go back to old things. We can do examine you. If you can't do an MRI because you've got a pacemaker, we could exam do a physical examination. We could do some tests called evoke potential studies where we flash lights in front of your eyes and we make clicking sounds in front of your ears, which we very rare, I hardly ever do those because the MRI tells me everything I need to know. But if I don't have an MRI, I could use some of those to measure nerve pathways, for example. So those are some other tests we could use. But there's no other scans that really replace MRIs very well, no. Dr. Stanko, where's your office closest to Hollywood? Closest to Hollywood? Hollywood. Um, closest to Hollywood. Where's my office closest to Hollywood? Stuart, Sunrise. Sun Sunrise where? Sunrise, Florida. <laughs> Pine Island Road by Oakland. I don't, I'm not advertising. I don't, go, I don't do advertising. But no, Sunrise in somewhere. West. Near the mall. You can go shopping the same day. Yeah. I've been on um, to Sabri for five years. This whole thing kind of kind of shook me for a minute. What shook you? That you should you should only be on it for two. No. Then you didn't listen to the whole thing, Patty. I lost it. You know I, me. Yes. I multiply okay. scrambled, no, doctor. No, I mean there are people. I have. I have. There are some patients that I see that have had a hundred infusions. And if you do one every four weeks, you can see how long that goes, right? That's a long time. That's six it's, years of, of, of Tysamic. They're the JC virus negative. So they have still, as far as we can estimate, a very low risk as long as they're negative. And I check their JC virus every three months in case they convert oh, yeah. to positive and it goes high. So we're using that test to help us evaluate how someone is doing. And we make people vigilant. We, we tell people, we remind them of their symptoms, and we see them regularly, and we do scans regularly. This is the way we monitor for this medication. But so if, you, if, you got, if you're JC virus negative, then you can still take the medication, and we still monitor you carefully. So I can take it for another five years? Uh, if you're JC virus negative, and you could, and we monitor okay. you, and you do your scans, yes, okay. well, maybe. Cool. Who's next? <laughs> She's first. Saw her hand first. Okay, so if we were told that he's in a higher risk group because he is a male, and particularly a black male, so he's going for his next MRI. He was just newly, he had one, this will be his second one to see how the Copaxin is working. If the MRI is not, isn't changed, should he still maybe, since he's in a higher risk group, maybe change, or if everything's fine, then stay where you're at? No, if, he's, if you're stable, I wouldn't change anything. So, you know, if you've taken a particular medication, you come in, again, you go through the same three things we're talking about. You've got no relapses, your examination's the same, your scan looks the same, your medication may be working for you. Even if you're in a higher risk group, it still could be working. It's just as an overall thing. So because the Medicaid, because certain people are in a higher risk group doesn't mean they all are, we just want to be vigilant in that situation. And so you're in this higher risk group, we need to watch you carefully and make sure, and we need to be on top of it and treat you more aggressively. But if you're stable at a particular time, we're not going to change anything. But then you need to be taking all your other things, right? Your vitamin D and everything else and the things you do for yourself are very important. Two more questions, or three okay. more. Could you comment on statins? Statins. Statins. <laughs> the question is just about statins in general? Okay, statins and MS. So yes, they have studied statins are drugs used for lowering cholesterol. They have studied them for years on and off for MS, and they found that maybe they have some benefit. In fact, a recent study published last year showed that people that take a certain statin uh, had a, lower, a slowing down of the progression of their MS with a progressive form of MS. The dose that they used was massive. It's like 80 milligrams a day, and for anyone taking a statin, that's much higher than the usual dose that most people use. It's a very high dose. On the other hand, I can tell you, there has been a study published as well in people on Rebif, that when they took Rebif and statin together, they actually seemed to do worse. 
So it's kind of out a little bit. I would never give anybody a statin myself because they have MS. If they have cholesterol problems, by all means, I'd say take your statin. But I would not, at this stage, we don't know enough to give it to someone. And statins have side effects. Statins have other side effects. Now, the latest evidence now about statins may be increasing the risk of diabetes, never mind anything else. Statins can cause neuropathy, so you get other neurological symptoms. You get muscle problems, liver problems, a lot of problems. Not ready for, not something I would just give because you have MS. Uh, Dr. Steingo, um, <clears throat> as far as um, bladder issues, if you have a constant bladder infection um, and uh, don't have elevated um, temperature, but uh, you know, increased spasticity and all that sort of thing, what do you do? Um, I mean, so, so the question is if you have constant bladder infections yeah, I mean, you just and can't then you have a lot of spasticity, what do you do? First thing you do is find a good urologist. And the urologist it's very says. The urologist says that you have to deal with, just you have a constant bladder infection and there's something to deal with. Well, yeah, maybe you need a good urologist. But no, so that's the first thing. Uh, you need to find, but then you need to find another way. And doc, well, Dr. Schaefer is going to talk about that. Is that right, Jim? You, hey, there he is. <laughs> You're talking about some bladder issues? So he's going to talk about some bladder issues. So there are ways, other ways of managing the bladder. The thing about the bladder is that uh, there are different kinds of problems with the bladder, and the problem with some people is how they have a mixed bladder. Sometimes they have frequency, sometimes they have urgency, sometimes they can't they retain the urine, they can't get rid of it. So how do you treat that? If you give them the drug to slow it down and they sometimes retain, then they retain too much. And there's urine sitting there and they get an infection. And infections with MS can be unusual. I told you before about the six o'clock Friday night phone call. Someone saying, I feel weak, and they don't have fever, but it's an infection. So they might react in unusual ways when you have infections. That certainly can happen. And sometimes people need to learn how to self-catheterize. Sometimes they have a permanent indwelling catheter. Sometimes we can have other form, other ways of dealing with such as a suprapubic catheter. We put in a catheter that drains the bladder so there's no urine sitting there and there's no infections and improving in the quality of life oftentimes. So I think that's it. We're done with our questions. Thank you, everybody. And thank Dr. Steingo. <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, the fist pump. We got to remember that. Um, for those that have not looked at our website, there is a very, very long list on there of all the programs that are coming up. For any men in the audience tonight, we have a program coming up on June 9th at the Boca Marriott that is and was designed for men with MS. It's the health issues associated with you as a man having MS. All right. And we've been doing a series on this on the women's issues. Coming down the east coast of Florida, we've already done five programs, and we're starting to head up the west coast of Florida with the same program on women's issues with MS. And the men are always asking me, when are you going to do it for the men? Well, now we are. So, guys, you're out here, you're in this audience, we expect you to get home tonight, get on this website, and get registered for this program, okay? And you don't have to go alone. You could bring your significant other, whoever that might be, all right? We just suggest that you do come and hear a different set of conversations, okay? Uh, we're gonna have, Dr. Steingo is gonna lead that program and then we're going to have either a psychologist or a urologist there as well. Plus, we'll have Jeff Siegel to do something on a little adaptive exercise for you all as well and um, how to reduce pain, spa pain from spasticity. All right, so these are things that yes, we do for the women's programs as well, but it is gonna obviously be slightly different. And the women can come, but during Q&A, like we do at the women's programs during Q&A, we ask the men to leave the room so that the women could just converse amongst themselves and with the speaker that's up here. Okay, so they could just get into topics that they may not want to bring up in front of any male that's in the audience. That night, if any females come, and it'll be after the food, yes, you can, then we'll go to the Q&A, and then we're gonna ask the ladies to just step out into the hallway while the men have the questions that they wanna to ask to the male presenters that are there, okay? So we do thank you and we want you to come to that as well. All right, and then there's just a, a, a slew of other topics, but if you use the website, you look at the newsletters, you see the emails that go out, you just pay attention to the, to the brochures or the flyers that you're getting. Uh, another thing I didn't mention before I bring up Dr. Schaefer, we just opened an office in Miami Yes, we're expanding. And at that office in Miami, we have a social worker who we now employ full-time, and she is giving a free community service for, MS Views and News is doing this, for anybody with MS in the entire state of Florida. All right? If you need any resources, whether it be transportation issues, learning where to get your, 
medications for them, learning how to get prescription assistance, anything that you basically need that you don't know who else to ask about MS. If you have certain concerns and you need to see certain physicians, she could help you out with this as well. Plus, we're going to have interns working with her there too, so we'll be able to handle several patients a day calling in. So these are just, again, these are some of the things that we're trying to do with MS Views and News and, and providing new topics. The land of MS is one of them. The communication tool, we hope to be able to get into every MS office in the state of Florida. And we're only starting here, and then we'll expand outwards. Dr. Steingo brought up that he's got his business card with all the information about, you know, what could possibly uh, affect you with the MS. Well, that's what you got from us at the front today as well. Again, we're just trying to provide resources and not just these educational programs.